Uh, and tonight, we will try gently so to make yet one more effort to try to wake up our people. That they might think and they might study the Quran, that the Quran might guide us. <coughs> we want to begin our topic not with Russia and not with Turkey, although these are the two most important actors of all, and not with China, no, but with Iran. And when we want to show the link between Turkey and Iran, we are forced to recognize that this one is Sunni and that one is Shia. And what are the implications of the Sunni-Shia divide for Akhir zaman and in particular for the Great War? That is not an easy subject at all. It requires thought. And we have to go to the Quran, which we'll do, which we'll do inshallah tonight. How do we define a Sunni? Here is my definition. A Sunni is one who recognizes, who recognizes Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu as the rightful successor of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is the head of state of the Khilafah state which was established in Arabia. He was the rightful successor. And then after him, of course, there was his successor, Umar al-Farooq, radiallahu ta'ala, and Usman al-Ghani, radiallahu ta'ala. This is the Sunni view. This is the essence of being a Sunni. Everything else is per peripheral and additional, <laughs> not essential. This is the essential thing that constitutes a Sunni. The Shia view, uh, unfortunately so, the Shia view, is that uh, it's difficult for us to even say it. The Shia view is that Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, if there are any Shia present and I'm I'm wrong, do please correct me. The Shia view is that Abu Bakr Siddiq, radiallahu ta'ala, was a usurper. That he was not the rightful Khalifa. The Shia view is that Allah, in his authority, he appointed Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, to succeed and subsequently that succession is limited to the house of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam or Ahlul Bayt. If I'm wrong, kindly correct me. This is the Shia view. That this was ordained by Allah himself and that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam was simply carrying out orders this is a great divide, a great divide. We are not going to look into the merits of the case tonight. Uh, what does the Quran say on the subject? Otherwise, we're not going to finish the lecture tonight. No. But the Quran does not support the Shia view. It is not. In the question and answer session, yes, you can want, if you want to utilize part of your time on that subject, I don't mind. So our view is that when Imam al-Mahdi comes, and he is one of the major, major actors of Akhir zaman when Imam al-Mahdi comes, then he will settle this issue. That when Imam al-Mahdi comes, there will be no Muslim, none, who would not recognize Abu Bakr Siddiq 
radiallahu ta'ala anhu as the rightful successor. And so when Imam al-Mahdi comes, this is going, this is something surprising. This is something surprising and our brothers, the Shia brothers are probably going to be stunned. That as soon as the Imam comes, the Shia faith is finished. There's no more Shia. So once the Imam arrives. And when there are no more Shia, you don't need the term Sunni anymore. So both Sunni and Shia will both disappear. Because once everybody accepts that Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the rightful successor, then there's no need for the term Sunni anymore. Those, of course, who have feathered the term Sunni with all kinds of other meanings, they, were, they are irrelevant to this subject. And at that time, therefore, Sunni and Shia will disappear, we'll all be Muslims, and we'll all join forces and fight behind the Imam as one united community. But the Imam will not come until Allah sends him. Although I am reliably informed that the CIA and the Israeli Mossad are very hard at work preparing an imam <laughs> and, and they would send him maybe by parachute <laughs> and uh, and those who are and they only eat the biryani and go home and sleep <laughs> they will they will accept them israeli mossad's imam <laughs> i say yes yes this is the imam <laughs> but we know that when the Imam comes, the first thing that the Imam is going to do is goodbye to Saudi Arabia. Goodbye to bad rubbish. Uh, of course, those who take the rials and the dollars from the Saudis to finance the masjid and finance the Islamic center, and so they are they are, in both, they are uh, obliged to accept the Saudis. They, they will not accept this, but goodbye to Saudi Arabia. Good ride to bad rubbish. And when the Imam comes, we know that the Khilafah state established by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam, that Khilafah state will be restored in Arabia. And Islam will once more have an authentic expression politically. This is there in the hadith of Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam when he prophesied that after his death, the first stage of the history of the ummah would be khilafa uh, ala minhaj al and then he said the last stage, in between, of course, you have so many different stages, but the last stage would be a return to Khilafah ala minhaj al -Nabuwa. And this will come with Imam al-Mahdi. My learned brothers in the um, uh, Hizmut Tahrir, uh, and they are learned brothers, yes, mashallah, uh, they differ with me and uh, they are confident that the Khilafah state, Ala Minhaj in Nubwa, can be restored before the Imam. I don't think it has been restored so far. And I don't think it'll ever be restored until the Imam comes. Now then, what is now important would be the period between now and the advent of the Imam. What will be the relationship between Sunni Islam and Shia Islam? That is the important point now. And there are two roads. There are two roads open before us. The first one is that in which Allah speaks in Surah Al-Baqarah. وَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا تَكُنْ فِتَّةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ الْكَافِرُونَ بَعْدُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْدِ The kuffar are friends and allies of each other. Well, this is Surah Al-Anfal. 
the kuffar, the disbelievers, are friends and allies of each other. Illam tafa'aluhu. If you do not also establish friendship and alliance, takun fitnatun fil adli wa fasadun kabir. There will be great fitna and fasad in the world. Chaos, anarchy, corruption, destruction. Of course, alliance will be formed with this ummah and people who are outside of this ummah. But the first place to establish the alliance is within the house of Islam. And we recognize the Shia to be Muslims. Oh yes, we do. But we differ with them on this theory of the imamat. And so the first road which is open to us between now and the Great War is to establish friendship and alliance between the Sunni world and the Shia world so that we can face a common enemy. That also will ensure the survival of Pakistan. The other road is that in which you do the very best that you can possibly do to try to provoke Sunni Shia civil war. And if that were to ever occur, the major beneficiary would be the state of Israel. No one will defer with me on that. And so those who are beating the drums of war with Shia Islam are people who are playing into the hands of Dajjal. And what is, what is the role of Saudi Arabia in this? It is very plain and clear. The war which has been taking, going on in, in Yemen for five years now, innocent Yemen, was meant to provoke Sunni Shia civil war. That's the excuse for the war in Yemen. And uh, the, the threats of attacking uh, Iran are meant to try to provoke Sunni Shia civil war. This is the immediate threat. And of course, you're all aware of that. What I need to remind you of, however, is that the Saudis have an agenda. They want Sunni Shia war, so that as soon as that Sunni Shia war were to begin in the House of Islam, they would then assume leadership of the Sunni world. And all Sunnis will have to close your ranks now behind the leadership of Saudi Arabia. But there is a competitor for leadership of the Sunni world. And who is it? Answer? Turkey. Yes, Turkey. And historically now, we have to look at the Ottoman Empire. That all through the history of the Ottoman Empire, without any cease at all, they constantly wage war on the Shia world in Iran. Sunni Shia warfare continued all through the years. The Ottomans were established for two purposes. Number one was to wage war on Shia Islam, and number two was to wage war on the Orthodox Christian world. Uh, if there are those who differ with me, you can do so in the question and answer uh, period, inshallah. And now, after the Ottomans had succeeded, in hundreds of years of warfare, in planting the seeds of Sunni Shia hatred and animosity for each other. And after the Ottomans had succeeded 
after centuries of bogus warfare, in planting the seeds of hatred and enmity and hostility between Orthodox Christians and Muslims.